Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Logan County in West Virginia, it is an area with thick, brushy mountains in the summer, located in the middle of the Appalachian Mountain. It was a mining and logging area. Some regions of this area are very sparsely populated and traveled. My sighting occurred while working as a security guard on top of a mountain in Logan, West Virginia. I was working the graveyard shift between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. on top of the mountain at a strip mine that was closing. The company was in the process of moving all of the expensive equipment to another site. I had a little trailer as an office and several large pieces of equipment and machinery surrounded the trailer. The location was sort of in a sinkhole that had been created at the top of this mountain due to blasting. I had just made a tour of the area, checking the equipment, probably 200 square yards total, and scanning the woods that surrounded the area. It was around 3 a.m. I found nothing unusual and went back inside the trailer and turned on the radio to listen to a talk show that I had been listening to each night. I started to put on a pot of coffee when I realized that there were no filters. A little building outside kept all the cups, filter, coffee, condiments, and etc. So I walked out to the building and grabbed a bag of filters when I heard a rustle in the bush about 20 yards behind the trailer. I went inside the trailer and grabbed my flashlight and went outside to check out the sound. At first, I saw and heard nothing. Then, to my right, was the sound of something taking off and running through the brush toward the mountain. The beam of my flashlight caught sight what I thought at first to be a black bear, which are quite common in the area. However, as I looked closer, I saw what appeared to be a large bipedal animal squatting behind a large thicket about 25 yards from where I stood. The beam from my flashlight raked across its body. It shielded its face with huge hands and then ran off into the night. 35 to 40 minutes later, while sitting in the trailer with the door firmly locked and pistol in hand, looking out the window, I heard what can only be described as a scream that absolutely chilled me to the bone. I have goosebumps now just thinking about it. This was about 16 years ago. I have tried many times to convince myself that it was just a bear. Deep down, I know what I saw that night was not a bear or any animal that I've ever seen or heard before or since. I really do not know what it was that I saw that night and have never told anyone until now because I know that most people will just think I'm crazy. I don't make any claims as to what it could be, but since then, I have researched the Sasquatch legend and read many books and features on the legend itself. The only thing I can tell you is this. When I listened to the sound recorded in Ohio, it sounded almost identical to the sound I heard that night. The sound, more than the sighting, scared me the most. It was nothing I've ever heard before or since, except the recordings from Ohio. After about another hour on the hill, I got up the nerve to jump in my car and get the heck off the mountain. I never went back to work there again. I talked to a guy that worked that area for years, and he said that he had never seen anything, but had heard some very strange screams. He attributed them to mountain lions or bobcat. What I heard was no feline. Anyway, I'm glad to see so many others have had similar experiences. Keep up the good work. Maybe someday we will find out just what it is that roams our mountains and forests. Who knows? The next day, I went to the site during peak daylight and searched the area where I saw the creature. I found nothing of interest except some broken branches and twigs where the creature had trampled them. Where the creature had trampled them. I found no footprints nor hair 
just broken twigs. There was a smell of rancid decay in the area for about two days. We could not find the source of the smell. I have read about people smelling them, but I don't know what they smell like. The smell that I detected was identical to a dead animal that was in the process of severe decay. There was another guard working about a half a mile away from me at the entrance to the mining company's property. He saw nor heard anything unusual that night. The sighting was at 3 a.m. The trailer was lit up well, but the surrounding area was very dark. I had a normal security type flashlight. The weather, as best as I remember, was humid and sort of hazy or foggy. Appalachian Mountains, top of a ridge on an abandoned strip mine. The trailer and equipment sort of set down in a crater created by previous blasting with mountains all around. About 200 yards from mountain to mountain. Summertime and very thick underbrush. Several of the old timers in the area have stories. Many people here hunt ginseng in the mountains and have told tales of seeing things that really don't make sense. There is a story of a wild man of the woods that I was told as a child. I don't know if it's just local folk tale or if there is any truth behind the tale. One of my co-workers told me that she had seen something in Cabal County one night while driving back home from work a few years ago. On to the next one. In Pendleton County in West Virginia, I and six other cavers got together to do some ridge walking and camping along several miles of limestone exposed on the east side in the Senca Creek backcountry. This is a remote and heavily forested section of the Monongalea National Forest and lies on the western flanks of Spruce Knob, the highest point in West Virginia. We planned a through hike, so I pre-positioned my vehicle downstream at the public parking area near the intersection of White's Run and Senca Creek. Then we drove around and upstream up to the trailhead where we started out. Hiking along or off the side of the trail, we passed the entrance of a few caves that were located on previous trips. We'd been working this area for a few months already. The area is heavily forested with second growth hardwoods that have grown up since the virgin timber was clear cut. In the 1890s, to 1912 logging era. We worked our way north toward through a region known for a series of large open meadows in the forest left behind by some homesteaders in the early part of the 1900s. We eventually found a number of small caves in the area, but none large enough that we could easily enter them. Most would require some digging. About halfway through these meadows, we left the trail completely as it wandered up the mountain and away from the limestone. We continued north and across the last meadow, then into the trees. We crossed a couple more ravines and finally, at the end of the day, found a nice flat bench on a remote ridge to set up our camp. We were six or seven miles in from the trailhead and still had five miles to go before reaching my SUV at White's Run. It was four miles or so as the crow flies to the nearest house on the far side of the big mountain. We were about as remote as you can get in that area. That night, we built a small fire and sat up to about 11 p.m. talking. The night was dark, clear skies, but the moon had set and not much starlight in the thick forest. We all backpacked light, so our light sources were no more than our headlamps and the firelight. The camp was dim. It was around 10.30 when I just finished telling something of a spook story. Everyone was a little keyed up, I guess. About 30 seconds after I finished the story, a single scream rang out from the woods behind me. It sounded to be 200 yards or more north, across the next ravine, and on the next bridge we would head for the following morning. It was loud, but not incredibly so. It was unlike any cry I'd ever heard in the woods and didn't sound like a bird call to me. More like a mammal, reminiscent of a woman's scream, but nothing like a cat's scream. It started low and rose in scale 
lasting about three to four seconds. It really caught our attention since we were all on edge from the story I told. It caused a bit of nervous laughter and discussion, and some of us decided it must have been some kind of screech owl. I've bought land in that area since then, and hear screech owls all the time. They sound nothing like that scream. We never heard it again, and by 11 p.m., we were all sacked out. The next morning, we got up and decided we had ridgewalked enough. It was Sunday, and we had five miles of rough terrain to hike before getting to the car, then a long drive home. We never visited the area from where the sound came from, Instead, we dropped down off our ridge to the trail following Senka Creek and back to my car. I've not been back to that particular spot since and would never have thought much more about it. But the event has stuck in my mind for 14 years. What I found Bigfoot websites online this year read reports about screams in the night and then noticed how many sightings were occurring within a 10-mile radius of this area. I thought it might be worth mentioning. Clearly not a strong report, but possibly more evidence in the growing collection for the region of Pendleton County. Some years later, a caver from the same group was with me at another bizarre event. About six miles to the southwest of the camp location, we found an unknown cave in a remote grazing area. The entrance was partially blocked by breakdown boulders, but enterable on hands and knees after climbing over the rocks. Just inside the entrance, there's a low room with a stream in the floor that flows into a passage heading downstream, deeper into the mountain. Blocking our way was the carcass of a large, white-tailed doe. Something had been feeding on the carcass as the entrails and soft tissue between the rear leg were pulled out or gone. Deer hair was also thrown about the floor and walls of the cave passage. We had to crawl gingerly over the carcass in order to push further into the cave. It was relatively fresh, maybe a few days old, but the odor had begun to kick in. Downstream of the carcass, we noticed a red tinge in the water. Blood was staining the stream. We had had enough then, turned around and left the cave. My friend retched once we got to the surface. We both wondered what kind of animal had motivation and strength to haul a large doe up and over boulders, and even through a narrow entrance before dashing it. We assumed either bear or coyote had decided to come back well after the carcass would be gone. We've yet to return. The witnesses were seven cars all together. We had been sitting around the fire talking, finishing with our evening meal. It was 10.30 p.m. on a clear but dark night. Moon had set and heavy forest blocked out the starlight. No houses for miles, only camp lights to go by. Clear weather, crisp but not yet cold, by Volkswagen standards. The area was second growth hardwood forest, approaching a hundred years or more in age. On to the next one. A couple driving through Boone County slammed their car to a halt when they spotted a weird white beast in a ditch alongside the road. It looked like a woolly white bear. Then they saw it had four eyes. The creature leapt out of the ditch and attacked the car, and the couple sped off. When they got home, they found scratch marks on the side from it. This was called the sheep squatch by the locals. On to the next one. Hawaii Volcanoes National Park still has an active volcano, although it has not had an eruption in years. The highest peak is Mauna Loa, with a summit of 56,000 feet over the depressed sea floor. This makes Mauna Loa 27,000 feet taller than Mount Everest. It is also the biggest mountain on Earth in terms of volume at just under 20,000 cubic miles. The park area was established in 1916. It has an area of 323,431 acres with just under 1.5 million visitors per year. Like many of the national parks, death rates are high, but there are usually clues like the 2015 case 
where an 11-year-old boy went missing in Hawaii National Park but was eventually found alive. John Cameron Reith, November 25, 1999, was not a good day for John Cameron Reith, given his disappearance from Volcanoes National Park. Reith worked as a researcher with the United States Geological Survey Biological Resource Division. He was a part of the Hawaii Manualoa area team. His residence was close to Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, which is outside Hilo. He was working on the Palia Restoration Project at the time of his disappearance. Reese had plans to take a four-day hike from Thanksgiving to Sunday. He told friends that he would hike from North Kohala's Pololu Valley to Waipio Valley in Hamakua. He asked an intern to give him a ride to Q on the 25 where he would start the hike. This intern told authorities he dropped Reese off at 7 a.m., he also told police that Reese was wearing a light-colored shirt, camouflage boot, and pants. He was also seen carrying a red Kelty Red Wing backpack, rain gear, tarp, hammock, camp stove, and four days of food. Reese explained his plans to those closest to him, which was to hike Awani Trail. He would hike several miles from Waimanu Valley, bushwhacking his way. Shortly after Reese set out, Heavy rainstorms began. Investigators felt it made the trail hazardous since the route has many dangerous features, including steep inclines. One witness came forward to say he gave a man with Reese's description a ride at about 12 p.m. The man said he dropped the person off at the intersection of Waimea Kaiwahai Road and Queen Kahumanu State Highway. Reese did not report to work on November 29th. The USGS reported him missing. Authority searched the area he was last seen. They checked Hokokane Iki Valley and the USGS cabin in the area. The cabin was placed there to help stranded hikers, so food and supplies were at the location. It was plausible to consider if Reese decided to hike there to get out of the rain. There would be some evidence. The search team did not find any disturbance at the cabin to suggest Reese stopped there. Everyone stated 22-year-old Reese was a responsible and experienced hiker. Reese was originally from Duncanville, Texas. He was working with the USGS as an intern. Timothy Joseph Lynch was visiting Volcanoes National Park in Hawaii when he disappeared on June 6, 2003. Originally a resident of Newburgh, Indiana, Lynch was visiting Hawaii. He was seen by witnesses between 9.30 a.m. and 9.45 a.m. toward the end of Chain of Craters Road. Investigators found his rental vehicle abandoned at the location. His estranged wife reported him missing. A little over a year later, in December of 2004, she declared him legally dead. His wife checked his answering machine since she still had the code. Presumably, she was checking for messages for her, but the report does not say. She checked the messages a few days after Lynch was considered officially missing and heard a message from Royal Kona Resort. It was this message that prompted her to report him missing. He had not returned home, but he also did not check out of the resort. The Royal Kona Resort was attempting to reach Timothy Lynch to determine when he would check out and pay his bill. Additionally, his June 6th return ticket was never used. Police did not find anything from the search around Hawaii National Park, the rental car, or the resort. Hiromichi Yoshino was 51 when he went missing on February 2013. A Japanese visitor to the island, he was last seen enjoying Volcanoes National Park. Park authorities found his rental car outside of the park. However, the territory it was found at was rough and sharp. Known as a dangerous area, police cautioned other visitors and locals to not explore there. Already in February 2013, five people had drowned. A couple others died in traffic accidents and two fell from cliffs. When the vehicle was found, it was unlocked with a piece of paper in the front seat. It had Hiromichi Yoshino written on it. 
They also found money and a receipt for entrance into the park on February 13th at 8.57 a.m. The keys were found in the ignition of the vehicle. Police asked for any information witnesses might be able to provide about the man's disappearance. Police were able to track Yoshino to a bed and breakfast in Volcano Village, but that was the only thing they could determine about his trip to Hawaii. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!